somebody like winemaking, you never get there, you know, you're, you're always on your way. I mean, you could say that about almost anything, I'm sure, but it's very obvious in winemaking. At the time I started the winery, I was making maybe 25, 30,000 a year, and that's what I had to, that's whatever I had left over, believe it or not, from that was what I could put into starting a winery. As a result, I didn't have vast ambitions for where it was going to go. I just wanted to do it. I've been a photographer since I was 13 years old. Uh, certainly, you know, there's several branches of philosophy that are of intense interest to me. There's, uh, it's, you know, no question about uh, my interest in art in general. I mean, I was an art dealer for 25 years after all. The real essence of being an art dealer is being able to recognize those things that really are exceptional. I thought that was excellent training. Uh, for being a winemaker because it did make you very comfortable about making judgments based purely on the senses. You know, there's no question what I love about it the most is, is making the wine itself. I mean, the whole process, really. I mean, I like getting up at 2 in the morning and driving a 15-ton truck, you know, 200 miles north and showing up at the vineyard in dawn, and that really starts the juices flowing. You really start thinking about what you're going to do. The secret of Joanne Robichon's cooking is not the subsoil of the plot that his carrots come from. I mean, get me a break. This whole thing is just so off, off the charts, warped. The whole theory of terroirs would be fine if you wanted to say that there are vineyard characteristics. Of course there are, obviously. But the way this whole gets, the whole thing gets warped is that the real estate winds up being what really counts. And anything besides real estate is sort of systematically devalued. I call it the dehumanization of winemaking. I mean, let's suppose it's a family winery. Let's suppose that, that Jacques is a great winemaker, but he has no clue whether his sons or daughters are going to carry this on with any intelligence, whatever. Still, this is the inheritance. If he can make the value of that in people's minds, dependent upon the fact that the grapes come from these, this particular piece of land, then he's way ahead of the deal. It's exactly the same as it would be in a restaurant. If it's called Chez Jacques and Jacques dies, well then what happens? It would be a perfectly reasonable question to ask, well, what do you think most people think about winemaking? It's some vague thing in their mind that involves some stainless steel tanks and some barrels. I mean, for me, winemaking is very much the, the process of all the decisions that you make in the course of fermentation. You're either there and you're making the right decisions, or you're not there and something else is going to happen and you better stand out of the way because it's not going to be good. I'm really on it, you know, 24 hours a day, sometimes literally, during uh, crush. And then once it goes into barrel, I like to just really let it sit. We hardly ever rack it. We don't make any additions. We, we're very, very conservative in terms of any, anything that's done to the wine while it's in barrel. Uh, it's only if it's absolutely necessary that we touch it at all, to be, tell you the truth. And I think the, the thing that is different about it isn't just that people don't know about it. They, I think, don't even suspect that there is as much to it as there is in terms of decisions that the winemaker is making and constantly making that have profound effects on the taste of the resulting wine. It started very, very easily. I finally got something bottled that I liked. And at the time, I was still involved as an art dealer. The gallery was called Thackeray and Roberts, and it was in San Francisco. And when we'd have openings at the gallery, uh, you know, we finally decided that, you know, there were only two people we knew were going to come to our openings, and that was the two of us. So we thought, why have bad wine? Um, and so we bought wine pretty regularly, and most of it came from a store then in North Beach called Singer and Foy. That was owned uh, by Stephen Singer, who at that point was married to Alice uh, Waters, and was the wine buyer at Shape and East, in addition to uh, having his own store in North Beach. I went over there one day, and I just mentioned to Stephen that I had bottled my first uh, wine. And he said, oh, I'd love to taste it. This was a very unusual reaction at that point. I mean, generally speaking, people, you know, if you said, hey, I've got some, 
of my new home wine. I mean, the last thing that someone at a wine store wants is to taste this. They just think, oh my God, this is going to be awful. What am I going to say to this good client of ours about how terrible this wine is? Anyway, so I took a couple of bottles over to Steve and he took them over to Chez Panisse. They loved it at Chez Panisse. He loved the stuff and he, he wanted to have it in the store. They wanted to have it in the restaurant. And then Steven said, hey, you know, there's this guy back east that is started uh, reviewing wine. Seems pretty good to me. I mean, I think I'll send some to him. And I said, fine, it's a guy named Robert Parker. And uh, he gave the wine, you know, 90 points or whatever it was. So that's really how it started. Uh, and it kind of went on from there. Oh, I don't grow grapes at all. I, th that was the irony of the whole thing. I planted a, a small vineyard of uh, Pinot Noir when I bought this house in 1977, and uh, it just didn't work. I mean, if I wanted to make dolmas, it would have been perfect, uh, since you know we had nothing but grape leaves. <laughs> that really is an advantage, not growing your own grapes. You're not trying to shoehorn grapes that don't really fit into the vineyard you happen to own. The Orion, for example, comes from a vineyard that was planted in 1905. I don't believe it's ever been fertilized. I don't believe it's ever been watered. I practically know every vine in that vineyard by its first name. I mean, we're old pals at this point. But the fact remains, you know, these same grapes went to Gallo before I started buying them. A great chef is going to be so serious about the quality of his or her produce. That, I mean, that, that's all they talk about. And yet the fact is, Somebody has to do something with this. Now the results will be totally different. Barrels are extremely important to winemaking because they're a spice. And you either want it or you don't want it. Uh, it depends entirely on the wine and what you want to do with it, I mean, clearly. It's, it's very dramatic. It's not a wine geek thing. I mean, the difference between, say, Trancé Oak and, and Vosges is huge. In my own case, I make a, a Sangiovese called Aquila, and I don't use any new oak. It just doesn't suit the wine. And the Orion goes entirely into 100% new French oak. Believe me, I've tried it every way. Uh, in used oak and same thing in steel and all kinds of things. That's what it wants. So when you first put wine into a new oak barrel, it will affect the taste of the wine inordinately strongly and very artificially. It tastes awful. It really does taste like you're sucking on a two by four that's been you know, dipped in wine. The natural tannins that are in wine, particularly obviously in red wine, and the, the tannic complexes, the phenolic complexes that are in the oak, form an entirely separate and new set of, um, of phenols that is not gonna happen uh, otherwise. And if that's what the wine needs, then there's no replacing that. If you're going to do notes, then the object, it seems to me, should be communication. And people's sensory backgrounds are so completely varied, it's very hard to come up with a vocabulary for talking about wine that's going to make any particular sense, except to the individual person involved. Who knows what Russian leather smells like? Elderberry flowers. Well, I mean, a friend of mine, she said, hmm, that, that's a wonderful nose of, of uh, intense nose of blueberries. And she said, no, 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 it's not blueberries, huckleberries. She was completely accurate, that's that, that, no, no question about it, but not very many people are going to know that. There's been a certain tonality to the Orion uh, aromatic that I've never quite been able to describe. But I was over at a, a friend's distillery. One of the things that he had made was a chocolate uh, liqueur. And normally I can't stand those things. But uh, this one was a very interesting aromatic, and there was a quality that I really immediately recognized that was similar to something in the Orion. And, and so I was asking him what he had made it from, and one of the things that he particularly used was uh, freshly roasted cacao beans, not chocolate, but cacao beans, and uh, that had just been roasted. And he said, have you ever smelled one? And I said, no, I never. Said, Why would I? know? I haven't. So he went, went, went and got a couple of them, and sure as hell, absolutely exactly what I had always tasted in the nose of the Orion. So it's got a certain little bitterness, a certain bite to it. It's not sweet, there's no vanilla, it's not chocolate, but it is definitely cacao. So it was interesting. I mean, so there's a tasting note. Now what, is, what good is it going to do for me to say to somebody, well, there's a certain grace note of freshly roasted cacao beans. Sounds good, I might sell more wine that way, but I really don't know if that's gonna tell anybody much of anything. Maybe it would. And this is a room that I have my book collection in. 
so it's all dehumidified. What I like is just the idea of this sort of magic communication with, you know, a 16th century Italian nobleman who's, you know, confronting the same problems that I'm confronting. The idea of letting grapes rest after they're picked, it's completely the exact opposite of modern gospel of winemaking, which is that grapes should be picked in the vineyard and should be fermented immediately. You know, I kept reading all of this stuff, really starting, the earliest reference I have to it is Greek poet Hesiod in the 8th century BC, but it keeps on going and showing up all over the place as a leitmotif through the entire history of winemaking. And what it says is that you should pick the grapes and then heap them up someplace, out of the way, and just let them rest for a while. And that if you do that, that the flavor of the grapes will be greatly improved and will make a much better wine. And that thought would never have crossed my mind as an idea. If this many people over this many centuries thought it was a good idea, it's a little stupid not to at least give it a shot. So I did, and I thought the difference was dramatic. Okay, well, this is a particularly interesting book. This is a late 16th century book uh, published in its original version uh, in 1600. And it's the most, by far and away, the most important uh, German text on... Uh, on agriculture in general, and certainly on winemaking of its era. I was picking this, the, the book up, and you notice this kind of discoloration on it. And it suddenly dawned on me, wait, that exactly fits my hand. That is the handprint of some 16th century German that owned this book. And then to make it more amazing, um, I, have a, <laughs> a, I have a little group that meets here occasionally to talk Latin with each other. It's you know, called Latinitas. And, uh, there was a woman who was there who is the paleographer for the uh, Ambrosian Library in Milan. And that's not a well-known library to the public, but it's one of the great libraries in Italy. She was talking about books that are bound in vellum, and I you know, thought of this one. So I thought, well, let's just take it out there and show it to her. Um, and so she, you know, I showed her the book, and she looked at it and said, oh, my God. And she said, do you realize what this manuscript is? And I said, no, I have no idea, whatever. She said, this... This manuscript could not have been actually written later than uh, the early 9th century. So she said probably about um, 820 to 830. It's, it's Carolingian. She says there are only a handful of such things that survive in the world. In other words, the cover of this book was 800 years old when this book was bound, you know, in the, in the 17th century. So, I mean, it's just, it's talk about a... Uh, a chain of sort of connection with the past that a physical object like a book can give to you. It's just, I mean, it's kind of overwhelming, really, you know. Well, you know, that depends entirely on the wine. I've opened two different wines here. One is a Pinot Noir, and it's pretty good right out of the bottle. The other wine that I've opened is the uh, wine that I make called Orion. Uh, which is extremely intense, very, very long-lived. It will age for at least 30 or 40 years, and it does need some time. I mean, actually, I've often had this wine be better four or five days after being opened. But, of course, wines age at much different rates, and they age in a different manner. I mean, Pinot Noir kind of goes along, and this goes up to the next little quantum level. It doesn't kind of go in a nice, even line like, say, a Merlot would. To me, a failure is a wine that is simply, that is bad and is unredeemable. You know, in other words, there's just something fundamentally wrong with the wine, and it's not going to change. And I don't generally really screw up that badly. What it does happen, though, is a wine that's incomplete. In other words, it will have many beautiful qualities about it, but it will also have some that, that just should be there and aren't. The aromatics will be lovely, but the mouthfeel will be a little short, a little harsh, or the mouthfeel will be really rich and soft and very pleasant, nice finish, but no real structure to the wine and the aromatics aren't too interesting. So I really did find with the Pleiades that I could use wines like that that were in no sense defective, except that they weren't complete. And I could actually complete them by blending them. And uh, I like that. You, could actually, you really could make something far better than the sum of its parts. You could ask exactly the same question of what's the best way to become a chef? Now, is the best way to become a chef to go and get a graduate degree in food science? 
before you even start looking at a stove? I mean, are you kidding? If you believe everything that you learn at UC Davis, then you want a simple set of scientific parameters that define what a good wine is, and you talk in, in, in terms of those things. It's got to be under a certain degree of alcohol, it's got to have a pH, it's in a certain range, it's got to, you know, and so forth and so on. The problem is these wines tend to reflect this kind of desire for a simple definition of what wine is. Rather than wanting to go into the business of wine and be really interested in the complexities of it, and in what can change in it and what might happen that you weren't expecting to happen, but that might be a wonderful thing. I'm not opposed to science at all. It's extraordinarily useful. I mean, malolactic chromatography, for example, or being able to measure pH. We always get a juice panel done, the highest sort of you know, technology available. The science is extremely useful and it should never be underrated, but it is not the essence of winemaking. The essence of winemaking is the art of winemaking, period.